be in Luke chapter 22 today if you want to turn there in your copy of God's Word or open it up on your phone. Before we jump in, I want to uh, embarrass slash celebrate somebody. Um, I'm not going to make her stand up, but Marsha, you're in the room, right? There we go. There we go. So just just for a little bit of background here. So there, it's often that I, during the middle of the week, I'll be like, I wonder if that book is... And I walk down to the library and sure enough, a book I'm looking for is right there. And uh, this sweet lady has been doing this for over 30 years in this church and quietly behind the scenes, praying through what books to get, thinking through curating what's on those shelves to find something for you that will spur you on in your life with Jesus, maybe grab your attention, draw you into helping you grow in him. And uh, that lady is Marsha Roddle, and she is going to pass the reins on to someone else. But I just wanted us to give a big, huge thank you and celebration for Marsha this morning. So thankful. And uh, what I love about it is that something that God had gifted her to do. And she wanted to serve the church and has done it faithfully and now has trained others to continue to do that. But if you see her afterwards or if you want to buy her or something, gift card, whatever, do it. Um, we love when you use your gifts for Jesus. And uh, I wasn't even here um, when uh, she started doing that. It's just very, very sweet. And we're just very thankful for you. Thank you, Marsha. Um, Luke 22, verse 39, before we read, I'm going to tell you about a, a, a trip I took with high school boys in 2002. I was a youth pastor back then, and uh, very much the way I'm wired is to uh, look for living illustrations and examples of things. And so we wanted to go and do missions. We wanted to share our faith with people, which is hard to do. Um, I had done something like that in college where you just try to strike up conversations with people in Europe. And so we were going to be on the train, we were going to be in the plane, and even a boat. So all of them, all the transportation modes. And so we worked on learning how to share our faith, how to strike up conversations that weren't cheese ball, um, where you're just actually listening to somebody. And we were going to study the Bible together. Uh, we were going to talk about what it means to be a man of God and what it means to give your life for Jesus, um, to sacrifice your life. And we use the vehicle of the path of the 101st Airborne in World War II to do it. And so we followed their path all the way through, shared the gospel as we did it and studied the Bible. And so I wasn't the best planner. And so every once in a while, a place that I had found like a schedule in the train or something, oh, we can go to this little village or whatever, because the path of the 101st was very specific and it wasn't always main big cities. And so there were some smaller towns in Belgium and France. And so we're trying to find these places, but sometimes we were trying to find them at about two and three in the morning. And so we were on a train and I knew we had to get off at something like 3.23 a.m. And the, I, can, I remember we're sitting on the train and here are all the guys, all the high school students, even the other leaders, and they are just like this, just conked out. And I knew if I went to sleep, we would miss the stop. And then I would be stuck with 15 high school boys with backpacks exhausted in the middle of nowhere in France or Belgium or somewhere. I had to stay awake. Somebody had to stay awake. And that was the story that the Lord put on my heart as I thought about this one this morning, because it was night. I was tired. I was exhausted. I, did, I wanted to sleep, but I had to stay awake. You know, the Bible uses night in darkness as a literary device. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think about the opening pages of the Bible. In the beginning, the earth was formless and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. Did he say, let there be darkness? No, let there be light. And he, that is mirrored in John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and word was with God. The word was God and the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness does not understand it. So the Bible is just, it's kind of, the Holy Spirit is, is really creative in the way he uses certain themes. Another one, my soul waits for you more than watchmen wait for the morning. So back in Bible times, back in way back when, they had cities with walls and they had people who would sit on those walls and watch to make sure nobody got in. Well, guess when they would come in? At night. 
So there's a lot of fear. They're sitting on those walls. And the psalmist wrote, I'm waiting for you, God, the same way that I wait for the morning. Because when they saw the sunrise, it was like, we made it. We made it through another night. Nicodemus went to Jesus first at night. Why? Because he didn't want to be seen. In, the, in secret, he wasn't quite sure. So scripture says he went to him at night. And then Paul takes this metaphor and runs with it in his letter to the church in Thessalonica. And he says this, listen to this verse. He's like very explicit about day and night, light and dark. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. Contrary to the song, we belong to the night, we belong, not that one. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep, stay awake like the rest, but let us stay awake and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. Now, why do I start with this? Because we connect with this metaphor, with this literary device of night and darkness and of sleep and being awake. Because what happens at night? Bad stuff happens at night, right? If that's when a lot of crimes, like statistically, that's when if you're going to party, you party at night. You don't want to be seen in the day. Stuff you either can't remember or you wish you could forget, right? We've all had bad nights, nights that where we wake up the next morning with deep shame and regret. And maybe for you, it's recent. Maybe it was last night. And the secrets that that night holds for you are hard to bear. And part of it is because there's this ache in your soul. There's a gnawing in us that says, I really don't want to live in the darkness. I want to be in the light. Scripture describes that, says God has placed eternity in your heart. He has this ache and this longing that you have to live in the light, in purity, in the beauty of the day. Well, today's passage goes to a night. And I've titled it, A Really Bad Night. The worst night. And in a strange twist, the answer to our darkness. The answer to the dark night of our souls. And so what's your job today? And I remind you this often because a lot of times we think, I gotta take all this stuff in, I gotta learn these things. Your job is to listen to Jesus today for one thing. Just one Ask him, Lord, what do you have for me today? It may be a detail in the story, a moment in his word. I had a guy come up afterwards and it was so neat because it was so clear God had given him this one detail in the story. And it was personal to him. It connected to something in his past, something he was dealing with. And he's like, this is how the Lord spoke to me today. He wants to do that for you too. A description in the scripture, a tap on the shoulder, a nudge from his spirit to say, hey, you know that thing you've been keeping in the dark, that thing you've been ashamed of? Let's go there today. And you may be like, no, thanks. The Lord's like, yes, that's the thing. And the amazing thing about Jesus is that when he asks you to do something, it's not hard to do because he's already done the work. It's not climbing and striving. It's falling back into the ocean of his grace. So just to keep that in mind, one thing, that's your job today. Once you get it, go to sleep. I don't care. Once you know the Lord's got you, grab onto it and lean in even more. So Luke 22, verse 39, let's read the first few verses. A really bad night. Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Now, what is this cup? The Old Testament describes this cup as the cup of God's wrath. That any person who says, I reject you, God. I am fine to stay in my own error and my own sins. I don't want you. Then God says, then you will rightfully drink of the cup of my wrath unless somebody else drinks it. So when Jesus says the cup, it's not just this like nice symbolic thing. He is talking about the cup. 
Father, if there's any way, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. They're sad, sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Let's jump right there to look at verse 39 again. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. Jesus went to the place that he always went. Why? Because X marks the spot. We've been talking about the plan of God. This is the agreed upon location that Jesus was to stand in the crosshairs of humanity and say, I'm ready. Max Lucado has a book, uh, and actually, Marcia probably put it in the library for you. I think she did, because I've read it from there before. But it is called An Angel Story. Cosmic Christmas was another name for the book by Max Lucado. It's one that I like to read this time of year, every year. And we used to read it on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Lucifer is in the throne room, and it's clear that God is going to earth. And he asks God the Father, where will we do battle? And God says, right there, that little town on a hill called Calvary. X marks the spot. Jesus goes there so they can find him. Now, he could have gone to Bethany. It's just another little hop over the Mount of Olives. His best friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, he loved going there warm hospitality, and conveniently located on the edge of the Judean wilderness. So if trouble comes, I'm just going to slip into the desert. I don't have to take this on. But he doesn't. He stays close. A few years ago, we went to Israel as a church, and we joined Austin Oaks Church, and we're going to do that again next winter, uh, January, February 2023. We're going to go with Austin Oaks Church again, Brandon Ziske, my good friend who was here last week. Um, but I remember the last time we were there, Brandon was teaching uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're sitting there, and it's down in the valley. You have Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane, Jerusalem, Temple Mount. And so you can sit in the Garden of Gethsemane, and you can see the walls to the temple. You can see the mosque that's there now. And you can see this path going down the side of the hill. And he just pointed out, he said, when Jesus was in this garden praying, he literally looked up and saw men coming with torches. They're walking down the hill to get him. And he stayed put. He didn't leave because this is the place. All right, fine then, Lord. This is the battlefield. War is coming. Troops are being gathered. Weapons hounded out. Orders given. So Jesus musters his troops, his crack troop of disciples. And he says, here is our strategy. You ready? Pray. Well, uh, what? That's okay. Okay. And he even says it. Verse 40. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. I imagine, mainly because I identify with the disciples and their struggle to follow Jesus, that some of them probably, when he said that, were like, okay, <laughs> drooping eyelids a little bit. I'm just, now, it's so late. I'm so tired. You ever had one of those moments where you're at a Bible study or at somebody's house and somebody forgets to pray and you kind of jump in and everybody goes, um... I mean, should we pray? And everybody's like, oh yeah, sorry. You know, it's like, it's almost like this, like we better at the beginning of the meal, you know, open church service, closed church service. But my question is this, what does Jesus know about prayer that we don't? That he says, this is what we're gonna do. This is the strategy. This is how we fight right here. This isn't just to be, to thank God for a meal or to open and close the service service, or maybe in a pinch, we might throw one up if we're really desperate. 
but honestly, sleep seems better. Jesus asks us to pray. His call to our hearts in this moment of battle is stay awake with me. Stay awake with me. Be with me in this. Now, Matthew's gospel, and this is one of the cool things about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all give different accounts of the gospels. And so if you look in Matthew, you may see a detail that you don't see in Luke. And one of the details you see in Matthew is Matthew says, yeah, this happened. All that stuff that Luke said, yeah, it happened. There was praying and he asked to pray. But then there was this moment where Jesus said, pray that you don't enter temptation. And then he said, Peter, James, John, come here. He brought him over, which he often did, the three guys. And he said, I am in anguish. I am in anguish deep anguish. Will you stay awake with me and pray with me? And there's a great moment in the Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's version of this, where you actually see Jesus saying this, and he's obviously in agony. And there's the three, Peter, James, and John, they're kind of looking there and they're, they have wide horse eyes. And they're like, what is going on? Jesus steps away to pray some more. And John looks at Peter and James and says, what is wrong with him? I love that moment because it shows you the full humanity of Jesus and the full divinity of Jesus. He's in anguish, sweating drops of blood. Stay awake with me. Sure thing, Jesus, right after this nap. But Jesus must not sleep. Somebody has to stay awake for this train stop. Somebody has to be awake on this dark night of the soul. So verse 41 says, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. Who measured this? Don't go past these details in scripture. That was the detail for the, the guy in the first service who came up to me. He's like, that was it. That was the thing that God got me, started getting me thinking about my shoulders and stuff that's going on in my life. That was the thing. He just, he dialed in to a stone's throw. Who measured this? If you've watched The Chosen at all, the series that's online, you can watch it for free, thechosen.tv. You can get the app and watch these amazing, you know, recreations of the stories of Jesus and the life of Jesus um, one of the things that they show is Matthew, the tax collector, now follower of Jesus, is quite the detail person. And so I imagine, sure enough, maybe later, they're in the garden after Jesus has gone back to heaven. They're recounting this story. They're trying to remember. Where was he? He's like, oh, I think he was here. He's like, no, I think he was over here. A stone's throw. A, why else put the detail in there? This is not just for, let's, let's dress it up. Let's make it a cool story. A stone's throw away, that should give you great confidence at the historical authenticity of this story, that they would put that in there. A stone's throw away. He knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup, God's wrath from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, not to get him out, to strengthen him for the task ahead. Yes, he's God, but he is also fully man. He doesn't leave his divinity. Philippians 2 says he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Doesn't mean he emptied himself of his divinity. It means he emptied himself of the rights to what he had as king. And so at that moment, God in the flesh was killable, as Tim Keller says. Okay, so he's fully man, he's fully God. And the gospel writers are trying to communicate something to us about this moment. Is it easy? No, it's very difficult. He's struggling, he's fighting, he's sweating, he's in anguish. His humanity is feeling what you feel when danger is close, which is what? I gotta get out of here. Fight or flight, flight. I don't want to face this. He's feeling it. Why should this give us encouragement? You ever struggle to do the right thing? You ever wanted to give up? You ever wanted to find an easy way out? Jesus completely understands. And where you have given in or maybe made the wrong choice, he doesn't. He stays. He makes the right choice. He stays put, perfectly submitted to God the Father for you, for me, for the world. Verse 45, when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? 
It's tempting to look at this and to say, how lame are they? This is the most important moment. This is like the moment in the movie where if you're watching a movie at home and you want to get up and go to the bathroom or go get some popcorn or something like that, if it's not that important of a moment, you say, just let it roll. I'll be right back. But if it's one of those where you're like on the edge of the seat, you're like, pause it. Pause. This is the moment in their sleep. Here's the thing though, because we, we could say, look how lame they are. Can't they get this right? They don't deserve Jesus. They don't deserve him doing this for them. But I believe Jesus is actually showing his deep love for them when he comes and goes, hey, wake up. Why are you sleeping? This is an important moment. <laughs> wake up. Reminds me of my mom when I was in high school and I would be asleep. She'd come in in the morning and it'd be like 10 minutes left before school starts. Get up, Chad. Okay. Yep. Yep. My dad showed love in another way. He would stand over me with a cup of water uh -huh. bloop, bloop, and drip it. You better get up. But they're, they love me. They care for, they want me to go to school. They want me to not miss an important moment in school. I think that's what Jesus is doing. I don't think he's coming over to scold. I think he's saying, hey, wake up. This is the moment. This is important. Don't sleep. Wake up. This is an appointment you must keep. Your salvation is at hand. The most important thing that can and will ever happen to you is happening right now. He could say, you couldn't stay awake for a brief moment while I'm over here sweating blood. Forget you, you little punks. If there's a moment he could bug out and call it a night, this is it. But he stays awake and he is showing them he loves them. Wake up. Wake up. Stay with me. I want you with me. If there's anything you could say about the whole story of the Bible, it's that God wants you with him. That's what he's saying. Wake up. I want you with me. But we aren't able to stay awake. Are they awake in this moment? The most important moment? The non, you got to pause the, mov the movie if you're going to walk away moment? No. Are we awake? No. But he is. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas. One of the 12 was leading them. Didn't just pass on some info. He is leading them. He drew near Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what would follow, that phrase right there stuck out to me. We're going to talk about it in a minute. When they saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? One of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no, no more of this. Knelt down, picked up the ear, put it back on, healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers, of the temple and elders who had come out against him. Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs when I was with you every day in the temple? You didn't lay hands on me, but this is your hour <clears throat> and the power of darkness. So while he was still speaking, a rustle in the shadows, torches casting an eerie glow as shadows move in the dark. Can you hear Jesus' thoughts in this moment? I can. And I hear him thinking, here we go. Here we go. This is it. You know, Judas was with Jesus for three years, with him listening, learning, ministering in Jesus' name. You could say that Judas was a pastor. He went out and healed people and did the miracles, came back excited, just like the rest of the disciples. We saw this, this is awesome. We did this stuff in your name. He broke bread with Jesus. Do you know that Judas actually knew more of Jesus' words and his stories than you do? He could give you firsthand accounts. Oh yeah, I remember that story. I could tell you exactly what he said. Eyewitness, an insider, as close as you can be to Jesus, where you could say about him, he gets it. He is one of the 12 Judas knows what this whole kingdom of God thing is about. He is with Jesus. And yet, traitor. 
and leading the mob. Verse 47, there came a crowd. The man called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Could have just pointed. That's him. Why do you do that? It's not just giving Jesus location. He's taking money. He's intent on helping them get him. Maybe this gives us some insight on the difference between Judas and Peter and why his path was so far gone down a path of darkness. But it's more than just saying, yeah, that's the guy, get him. The betrayal has a twist of the knife because what does Jesus desire from us? Close friendship, close relationship family, to be our older brother. And so when Judas kisses him, it is a mock. He's mocking the very thing that Jesus wants, relationship with us. How about the rest of them? Verse 49, how are they doing in this moment? When those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, let's Go for it. Should we swing the sword? And one of them actually took a shot. And if you read some of the other gospels and the language that's used here, what's usually portrayed in some of these stories, if you think about it, you think that the guy went like this, and just slice, here goes the ear on the ground. But as you read it and you notice the part of the ear that is cut off, it's this part down here, which means this. What was he trying to do? Cut off his head. The he being Malchus, the servant of the high priest. What is happening? We're awake now, Jesus. Adrenaline pumping, anger flowing, sin raging. We get it. We're ready to do whatever you want now, Jesus. Onward, Christian soldiers. We're with you, Jesus. I love this picture from the Passion of the Christ. This is Malchus on the ground in the moment of chaos the disciples are going nuts they're running peter has just swung his sword he's being tackled by the temple guard here is malchus down on the ground and his ear is gone and he's hearing ringing what is happening and jesus isn't looking at anybody else but him the enemy you came with the enemy to get me I should not care about you in this moment. I should let you bleed to death, you evil person. What does he do instead? Hey, buddy, hang on a second. And you see it in this moment because after they take Jesus away, one of the greatest scenes in the Passion of the Christ is Malchus is the only person left in the garden and he's on his knees and he's going like this. I couldn't even hear that well out of this ear before. And now I can hear everything perfectly. It's a beautiful moment. And the reason is because Jesus is on mission. They saw what would follow. Did they see? Were they seeing? Were they understanding? No. You cannot have any more striking evidence, pun intended, of misunderstanding Jesus' mission than the swing of this sword to remove a man's head. And Jesus' response, verse 51, no, no more of this. He touched his ear and healed him. Think about what just happened. The people who are arresting him, one of them's wounded. He picks up that man's ear, reattaches it, and rebukes his disciples for completely misunderstanding his mission. How many moments in our history has this misunderstanding happened? Too many to count. Some of them have been so grievous. The Crusades, in the name of God, I'm killing you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I'm killing you. Reformation, which we would all say, hey, that's a really good thing. I mean, our our Protestant faith is based on the reformation of somebody standing up and going, no way, it's not works, it's grace. We're like, yeah, except that they had some mishaps when they started killing people too. In the name of God and of grace. Oh, misunderstanding. Philip Yancey has a new book out. One of the best authors that I've read. Autobiography about his life growing up in a legalistic, fundamentalist church in the South in the 60s. 
the 1960s. And he said, where civil rights and people trying to argue for the rights of all people in this country, Christians should have been the first to line up and say, absolutely, he said, but my church, our deacons had cards to hang out to people of another race and anybody who was involved in the civil rights activism. And here's what the card said. We know you're not a sincere worshiper and that you're a troublemaker. You're not a child of God. You're not welcome here. Misunderstanding the mission of God. You want us to swing a sword now, Jesus? Who should we kill first? And I would say, only because my own heart has been drawn in the last year and a half, there have been some other opportunities to misappropriate the mission of God with things that have been going on in our world. Meanwhile, Jesus is picking up ears and putting them back on. That's him. Are they with Jesus? No. Verse 53, he reminds us that this is a plan that's on target. X marks the spot. Also, tick, tick, tick. Yep, okay, it's your hour. You're up, boys. This is your hour, the power of darkness. Missions on schedule, have at it. And you can imagine Jesus. I'm gonna stand on this X. Tick, tick, five, four, three, two. Yep. Take me. Have at me. Because that's why I was born. But the subtext says this. But your time is short. This is your hour. Yeah, power of darkness. This is your moment. But it's limited. One of my favorite retellings of this moment, and that's remember I mentioned about the Gospels and the different details. John gives a, an amazing detail of this moment. John 18, verse four. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, yeah, who are you looking for? Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. And it's the same I am that you hear in the Old Testament when God speaks from the bush. I am. And you know what John said happened? Everybody standing with, with a torch and a club instantly fell back on their faces. And it's funny because John says, Jesus even said, hey, I told you it was me. What are you doing down there on the ground? Take me. On schedule. He's in control. So Jesus, to this point, has asked them to stay awake. They slept. He's asked them to be with him in prayer. They slept. He's asked them to be with him on mission. They're trying to kill people. They're running. They're betraying. They're fleeing. Whew. This is not going well, is it? If we're on mission with Jesus, this is a big fat failure. But here's the truth of the gospel. And before we get into the last few verses, he is with them though. He is with them and he is wide awake. And he is on mission. Verse 54, they seized him, led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. Peter was following at a distance. Listen to these details. I love them. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, sat down together. Here comes Peter. And he's like, is this seat taken? Cool. Just want to warm myself by this fire from all you people who just tried to kill my, never mind. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Peter sat down among them. <laughs> then a servant girl, seeing him as the firelight flickered on his face, she looked close and said, hey, hey, this, this man was with him. He denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, yeah, yeah, you, you're one of them. Peter said, man, I am not. Hour passes. Another insisted, certainly this man also was with him. He too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. 
the Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and wept bitterly. So Jesus is seized, captured, assaulted, and taken to the high priest's house. We actually got to go to this place. If you come with us next January, February, you will get to go as well. And it's very powerful because there's a prison cell underneath the house. And you see where Jesus was tied up waiting for trial. The disciples, what are they doing at this point? Running, running, fleeing. It actually says one of them ran naked. Somebody tried to grab him and just pulled his clothes right off. So he's running somewhere naked in the night. I think it was John. (laughs) But the camera zooms in to one. Luke wants your attention on one people. So yeah, he ran, he ran, he ran. Jesus is gone, but hey, look at Peter. What is he doing? Verse 54. Peter was following at a distance. This is another prophetic and literary device. This isn't just proximity. Peter was like 20 steps behind. This is Peter was following Jesus at a distance. He's not all in. And then he's sitting with people who hate Jesus. I always wonder about these details. Who gave them to Luke? Is this Peter's account? I believe it is. Let's imagine the interview. Across the table, Peter sits dirty, sweaty, nervous, cup of coffee in front of him, eyes darting around the room, shaking. What happened, Peter? They came with torches and clubs. It was a mob. I tried tried to fight. I I tried to kill him. Who? Malchus. I, I, I swung for his head. But Jesus, Jesus what? Jesus healed him. He put his ear back on. And then what happened? Well, they, they took him. I, I stayed back. I I distanced myself from him. I was so ashamed, but I didn't know where else to go. Where was everyone else? Gone, fleeing into the night, afraid. Were you afraid? Yes, but you didn't run. No. What were you doing then? Well, there was a girl, this servant girl. She was so annoying. She was all up in my face. I just wanted to see what would happen to him. Verse 56, the servant girl seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him said, this man was with him. No, I wasn't. Someone else, you are one of them, aren't you? No, I'm not. Certainly this man was with him for he too is a Galilean and the other gospels tell us that at this moment it wasn't nice and clean. Man, do not know, I do not know what you're talking about. It actually says that Peter said, man, bleep, 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 I don't know him. Right in the Bible. And then you saw him? Yes, well, he saw me. Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Remembered the saying of the Lord, I said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. No, I won't, Lord. He went out and wept bitterly. What did that look look like? Was that a, I told you, how could you? You denied me. What's wrong with you? If you read the Bible, all of it, that's not what the look was. The look was, I know, and I love you. I got it. Hold fast, I've got it. I know, and I love you. And I've got it. The question to Peter that he got asked three times actually comes to all of us. Aren't you with Jesus? Aren't you one of those people that goes to that cult place over there in Pleasant Valley? Are you one of those Christian people? 
believes in this crazy stuff about God and no, yeah, no, I don't know. Here's the truth. And actually, this is a first step to truly following Jesus. Your first answer is, no, I don't know him. Not anymore. That's like understanding of our own separation from God. There's something in me that I think I used to know him, that I'm supposed to be with him, that I'm supposed to be in relationship with him. The Bible says he has placed eternity in your heart. He puts this ache so that when you're at night and you were living it up, there's a part of you the next morning that says, why did I do that? I don't want to live like that. What is this inside of me that won't let me live like that? Jesus says, yeah, yeah, because you belong to me. (laughs) And your first answer is, no, I don't know him. Well, Lord, how does this thing end? This is a really bad night if the whole thing is up to us. If this is just religious, legalistic, works-based garbage, and by that, and a lot of us have done this, one part of our life, I know I have, we think, I better do better. I better tip the scales of righteousness in my favor enough so that on the day that I die and I stand before the Lord, I look at him and I go, ah, see, I think I, 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 think I got it just, just enough, just enough. And we hope we get in. If that's what this whole thing is, this is a bad night. Because these are the guys, these are the insiders, these are the soldiers, this is the crack troops, the disciples. They're supposed to be on mission. They're supposed to be taking down the enemy with him. And what are they doing? Sleeping, running, betraying, fighting, denying, crying. Oops. If it's all this way, it's a bad night. Peter denies him, the disciples run. They also deny any association with him. But here is the beauty of the gospel, and this is what the Bible tells us. But Jesus doesn't deny knowing them. And this morning, Jesus doesn't deny knowing you. And in this moment in the scriptures, when your soul was on the line and the father came to him and said, what about that one? He's a tool, Chad. Do you know him? Father, I knit him together. I made him. Yes, he's separated, but I've come to die for him. I know Chad Ellenberg. I've come for him. You put your name there. Jesus doesn't deny knowing you as his image bearer, precious and beautiful. And if that's true, this is a great night. This is a great night. On the night that we were most certainly not with Jesus, he was and is Emmanuel. God with us, standing on the X, holding out his arms, staying awake, going forth even when we deny him. God's solution to our inability to be with him is to be with us. That's his answer. I'll go there. I'll be with them to stay awake, to stay on mission of loving the world in sin and darkness and to stay put even when we run away. And if you keep reading this book, and we're gonna finish up Luke here in a couple of weeks, you know that Peter, the big fat failure in this moment, becomes one of the key pastors in the church in Jerusalem. In just a few weeks, he's gonna be standing up in front of about 3,000 people saying, this is the real deal. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, Jesus died and rose and everything's great. He's going to be the guy. And you're like, really? Like of all the people, this, the one who denied him three times, he's crying, he's not even following, he's going to be? Yes. Yes, because of grace. (coughs) And it would be the same with the rest of the disciples. Jesus would entrust his gospel, his grace to them. And so the question for us is, how about you? How about you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for um, these moments in your word. I love, love the details. A stone's throw, a kindled fire, you looking into their eyes, heavy with sleep and sorrow, trying to stay awake, sweat 
like drops of blood. Or these things stick in my mind and my heart. And they tell me, Lord, that this is real, that this is true. God, it tells me that your promise is what I need to grab onto, that all your promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So Lord, if uh, any of us here are needing a nudge to maybe lean into one of those places that we have kept hidden in the night, would you faithfully give us the grace to do that? If it's time for us to leave behind a legalistic, garbage, works-based faith that is counting on us to do a good job, to do better, then maybe today is the day we do that. To be found in you, Jesus, realizing you've done everything for us. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you for this time. Would you continue to speak to us as we sing together? Amen. If you feel so led, let's stand and sing.